Hello, everybody, and welcome to Unit 3, Psychological Disorders. Bit of a disclaimer here first. We're not going into real deep detail. This is not a deep dive into psychology or psychological disorders. I am, again, not an expert. I don't feel comfortable or qualified to do that. What this is is a description of the broad categories of psycho psychological disorders and what the impact is for nutrition therapy for people with psychological disorders. If you'd like more of a deep dive on the history and kind of breakdown of what psychological disorders are, there is supplemental, supplemental material in the module. Wow. Man, we're off to a great start. So let's have, <laughs> with that fantastic start, let's just go head on in. So you may have heard before, biology is chemistry, psychology is chemistry, nutrition is chemistry. It's, it's chemistry all the way down. It's likely that many psychological disorders come from some sort of biological dysfunction that, uh, it, that creates a chemical imbalance of some sort. Many psychological or drugs for psychological conditions are attempting to address that neurochemical imbalance. Geriatric patients with mental disorders are at an increased risk of malnutrition. And the, the real reason for this is that both the disease state and a treatment can affect intake. So being depressed can affect someone's intake, whether they have an appetite or not, what they choose to eat, if they have the energy to make food. Also, the treatment can affect intake. A lot of medications for psychological disorders impact appetite. The trend is toward cachectic outcomes in geriatric patients, which is really unfortunate. That's, that's what you really want to avoid in, ger in geriatric patients is cachectic outcome because they're so prone, remember from last time, they're so prone to this already. But you know, uh, psychological disorders also have a tendency to cachectic outcomes. So mm -hmm, uh, I will say anecdotally that the one thing that I have seen is that it seems that the reaction that you do not want from a psychological from treatment of a psychological disorder is what you get. So if you have a patient who is not is already very small, is not eating very much or very well because of psychological disorder, uh, they tend toward cachectic outcomes. If you have a patient who has overeaten due to the, a mood disorder or something like that, they tend to have an increased appetite with treatment. That's that's anecdotal, but it seems to be, in my case, it has been frustratingly true. So we're going to talk about which uh, each one of these, the broad categories again. Uh, starting with mood. Mood is the one, mood disorders are the category that most people think of when they think of psychological disorders. These are obviously kind of what you'd expect. These are alterations in mood, feelings of sadness, being overly happy, fluctuations between the two. Now everybody obviously fluctuates. We're talking massive fluctuations, very out of proportion to what is happening or a lack of mood at all. It may just be a flat affect and they have no kind of, of mood to them. Examples of this are depression, bipolar disorder, mania. Now, and maybe the only woo moment for geriatric patients, uh, mood disorders appear to be less prevalent in the geriatric population versus the average adult population. We're looking at the average adult population has about four and a half percent suffer from a mood disorder uh, versus one percent in geriatrics. Now there is kind of a bummer side to this, which is that it's possible that this is because people with mood disorders do not live as long as people that don't have them. And so by the time we get to geriatric patients, some of those people may be gone. We don't know. Um, there also appears to be um, a rise in the oldest old. Now, the oldest old is a subcategorization of geriatric uh, individuals. This is not an official terminology. There's no real set standard for what the oldest old is. Roughly speaking, it's approximately 65 to 75 is considered the young old. 75 to 85 is old, and then 85 and above is oldest old. But that's again, that's not official, and that's kind of why I haven't done that yet. But many of the studies appear to show a decrease in older populations until you hit that oldest old category and then it starts to go up again. Um, increases, 
mood seems to increase, a mood disorder seems to increase the risk of other mental disorders. As some people call it, a, a gateway mental disorder. Now, there is a question of that too, which is, is it kind of a situation where, similar to like an endocrine disorder, where if you have diabetes, puts a person at a higher risk of having an other, developing other conditions, pancreatitis, something. or is it that these already existed and once the patient is in there with an expert, that the uh, therapist is saying, you know, yes, definitely depression, but you know what I also see is X. Well, again, we don't know. Uh, the, the whole area, field of psychological disorders is very broad and it's very, very poorly understood at this time. The second broad category is anxiety disorders. Anxiety kind of manifests in a couple of ways. It can manifest as a sense of doom or danger in which somebody becomes, they, they cannot explain why they're so anxious or they're so convinced something bad is going to happen, but they're absolutely convinced it's going to. It may be a fixation or a extrapolation of worst case scenarios uh, to the point of ridiculous to somebody looking at it from the outside in um, on something that like maybe it could happen. And sure, you know, in a really strange series of circumstances, it might, but probably not. Or um, it may just manifest as um, a, a specific fixation thing. So we're talking like it could be a broad, a broad sense of danger, of uh, fixation on one particular thing happening, or this idea that something might spiral out of control. Um, this can manifest in, in the same way that anytime if you feel anxious about something and think about how you feel and then carrying that all the time. So this can manifest to people as um, make them irritable, make them quick to anger, make them uh, snappish. Uh, can also take away their appetite because, you know, when you get stressed out, how well do, do we eat? Some people stress eat. Some people lose their appetite when they eat. This uh, Examples of this are PTSD, general anxiety disorder, OCD, phobias. It's not very common in elderly patients. About 4% of all elderly patients present with this. The comorbidity with depression is very, very high. More than 33% of elders with mood disorders also present with anxiety. So it's a double whammy. You already have somebody who's feeling, say, sad or they're not able to at least experience happy, and now they're anxious also. So you can see how these, these compound to create problems with intake. Psychotic disorders are um, disordered awarenesses or altered perceptions of reality. The schizophrenic, schizoaffective disorder, excuse me, paraphrenia, Capgras delusion, which is a, a, situ, uh, a disorder in which you believe that somebody has been replaced by a doppelganger. Um, this is what I was talking about in the first part or the introduction when I said that the signs and symptoms differ by culture. This is the, I w this is referencing the study that found that people from India found or kind of enjoyed their schizophrenia. Uh, they found it to be a supportive helpful thing and people from Western cultures typically do not. So very obviously there's a cultural component to some of these disorders that we don't understand. Okay, eating disorders. Now I know this is one that everybody is in this group is familiar with to some degree. I don't know a single dietitian alive that doesn't find this fascinating. Uh, eating disorders are extreme emotions, attitudes, and behaviors related to food and weight. Again, this is a psychological disorder group that is very clearly tied to cultural norms. This is cultural norms taken to the extreme. Examples of this are obviously anorexia nervosa, bulimia, binge eating disorder. Remember, anorexia is a loss of appetite. Anorexia nervosa is a condition. Okay? Just want to bring that back up because we're going to be going back into anorexia again, not anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is far and away the most common type of uh, eating disorder. 81% of patients with an eating disorder present with anorexia nervosa. Geriatric patients can get this. Uh, geriatric patients can develop this. 
sadly, a lot of people that a good number of people with eating disorders um, do not make it. Uh, if you looked at the, the rate of mortality for eating disorders is uh, 21%. So it's possible these are people with recurring conditions. I have worked with patients that have had eating disorders in the past and man oh man are their families on top of that. Uh, they can also develop as a person gets older. There's really no point at which it's most commonly seen in, young, in teens and young adults, but it's by no means limited to that. Um, again, because they are so prone to cachectic responses anyway, geriatric patients tend to present with a greater amount of weight loss percentage-wise than a younger adult. Addiction to impulse control is an excessive desire to participate in a particular activity or habit. It can also present as an inability to regulate one's behavior during the activity and for purposes of us here in this group, in this class, you know, there's the examples there's like sex, shopping, gambling, substance abuse. Now, there's definitely an argument to be made as to whether or not being physically dependent on something like uh, cocaine versus um, shopping addiction are quite the same, and I, this is not the forum to discuss that. What we're looking at here is the disorder as the inability to control oneself. So there's not for us an adi a difference between a sex addiction versus a drug addiction. This isn't something I see very commonly in geriatric care. It can, it obviously can. Geriatric population can develop anything that they feel like. Rem remember, they have as many conditions as they damn well please. I just don't see this one very often. Uh, personality disorder is extreme inflexible personality traits that are distressing to the person and or interfere with the person's ability to function effectively in society. Um, this is your classic associated, um, associated personality disorder, narcissism, um, psychot is psychotic disorder that's it's not really used anymore, like anti-social anti personality disorder. There we go. Um, so any kind of rigid personality disorder. This also presents as an inability to empathize or understand somebody else's discomfort or their emotions. Again, this is not something I typically see. Um, I don't know what the rates are for the general population. I see conflicting amounts and I don't, I have not found any literature on how much of the geriatric population experiences this. I would wager it's pretty small, but again, I, I don't have the uh, data to give you that. So pharmacotherapy, all psychological medical intervention has the potential to alter um, PO intake habits. Two medicines that specifically address appetite. So what you're looking at here is that you may have either a medication that alters somebody's intake and makes them eat less, or you may have somebody who presents with decreased appetite due to the disease state. Both of the, well, I guess both of them. I was going to say either of these could happen, but both of them actually could be happening. There are two medications that are specifically um, given to address PO intake. They, I see these a lot, in, especially in long-term care settings, but often in the geriatric setting as a whole. Uh, Magestrol is the first one. Megase is the brand name for that. It's an appetite stimulant. It was originally designed to give for patients that have HIV and cancer. It... Um, it does have some kind of nasty side effects to it. It has increased risk, increased, good grief, increased risk of pulmonary thrombosis or adrenal insufficiency. It's not the first choice because it's got some pretty heavy duty side effects. Again, looking at the original case, the patient case for this drug, you can see why the two options they had, uh, cancer and HIV patients, uh, and, may, and their cachectic states that they can develop versus the possibility of developing adrenal insufficiency. Yeah, the, the cost-benefit analysis of that is pretty straightforward. Uh, but for, again, an older person who's, and again, older, right, is in somewhat in quotes here, because if they have, you have someone who's 70, they've got easily, a, pretty easily, at least another 10 years, they can expect to go. 
So maybe that's not the best choice. The other one you'll see is mirtazapine, which is a brand name Remeron. This is actually an antidepressant. It was described to me by a physician's assistant as the best bolt-on antidepressant she had ever worked with. Um, it's especially good for people who are suffering from lack of appetite due to mood or anxiety. So if you have someone who is not eating because of their condition, they may benefit from Remeron. Now, obviously, you cannot prescribe Remeron, but you could certainly recommend an appetite stimulant if you have a patient who's complaining about lack of appetite. So a couple of things to discuss with, about dealing with patients with conditions, with psychological disorders. Very often, a patient who is going through a psychological episode is aware that they're going through an acute episode. Psychological disorders are a lot like other kinds of chronic conditions in that you have times when things are going kind of flat. And speaking as an asthmatic here, you're going along pretty flat. Everything's fine. It seems pretty well controlled. And then suddenly there's a flare up. So somebody going through a flare up ish episode is very commonly aware that they are going through it. So, and I'm not saying that I've seen a lot of practitioners do this, but I do see a lot of family members doing this. Telling a patient that it's all in your head doesn't help. They're aware. That's one of the things that actually causes more distress from a psychological disorder is that they are experiencing a thing, they are feeling a thing, and they're completely aware of the fact that they should not be doing it. There's not really a good reason for that, but they can't control it. So telling them, this is just all in your head. It, yes, I know. Thank you. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that people in a psychological episode will still act in a way that's logical and consistent and rational to them. It may not seem logical and rational to you, but it is in their mind, it makes sense. So what are the treatment risks? A lot of drugs for psychological disorders can induce cachexia. There is some evidence that they also that positively associates them with diabetes development or exacerbation. And there are some especially things, um, especially anti-anxiety drugs, can cause lethargy, fatigue, dizziness. So the falls of risk of falls and fractures increases. It's always a cost-benefit analysis. What is this person's quality of life at this time? What would it be like if something went very badly wrong? There's never a 100% good option on these. Other interventions, uh, cognitive or rational behavior, be, but man, wow. Cognitive or rational behavioral therapy, the CBT or RBT, has been shown to be effective, especially for anxiety disorders. Some conditions can be controlled. There is a very high recidivism rate in geriatrics. So the number of geriatric patients that have psychological disorders is not high compared to the general population, but it's very, very hard to control these conditions. So the MNT, generally speaking, um, I know we discussed a little bit here, is because when you're having someone who's challenged, because the biggest challenge of psychological disorders is making sure they don't become cachectic. So um, nutritional bribery, if you will. Liberalize the diet as much as you possibly can. Nutritional supplements are often, I know you're probably being told or in your practice, you don't like to do supplements if you don't have to. We always go for, you know, food is best. This may be a situation when supplementation is the way to go. So we're liberalizing as much as we can. We're supplementing as much as we can. That is nutritional or nutritional supplements. No, it's not. That is psychological disorders. I'm going to now intimidate you with a, few, with a wall of text. I will catch you on the next one. Y'all have a great day. Bye.